to you how to paint and draw from life. Uh, sometimes it's scenes of Long Island, sometimes it's still life, but because that the great sea season is upon us, um, it's a still life this, this time, and it's going to be done in two parts because it's a little bit complex and there's no point in rushing through something and not really making it clear, so I brought in a nice piece of ceramic ware from uh, the craftsmen of Northern Virginia. These things are made probably everywhere, but this one happens to have been made in Northern Virginia by a craftsperson and um, that is based in Front Royal, where I now live, and I think it's a rather charming piece. And of course, it, um, it's a very seasonal, and no, there's no guessing about that. But the point is that these things are made in America by Americans for American consumption, which is a uh, uh, which is one of the uh, one of the um, interesting trade problems uh, that is going on today, and uh, I think that this craft is quite wonderful. It is uh, relatively inexpensive. It's forty dollars. So this nice piece, which is approximately fourteen or fifteen inches high, is uh, so somewhat of a somewhat of a nice thing to own and to have, and it's probably even just as good to paint and draw. So here I am. Uh, looking at this object and wondering, where do I begin? And so you begin, obviously, I believe, at the top, uh, trying to visualize just about how much space this thing is going to occupy. Uh, the uh, holly is in the back. Maybe it's a gratuitous. It's maybe probably not necessary, but nevertheless, I thought it was a sort of a nice a little addition to it, and if it, uh, if I have to squeeze it in order to make it work, then change it, or maybe even change the uh, the whole idea of the holly. But the figure is the important thing. <clears throat> so. Uh, the figure, uh, actually, I would like to have it occupy almost the entire canvas. <clears throat> so I start from the top. Um, and the proportion of this kind of thing is one of the main problems. How do you, how do you keep it so that it uh, doesn't run out of space at the bottom? Uh, the way you do that is to make it under life size. If you do anything over life size, uh, you have to be prepared to have a, a very large canvas on which to work. And one of the main things is to get it so that it is um, so that it's perpendicular, so that it stands up straight. So your guideline is to make sure that this figure is going to be standing upright. And then, of course, the imaginary line in between is what's going to guide you as to what goes where. Assuming that this uh, figure, uh, and I've called this uh, St. Nick study, that the figure, uh, that the face is going to be centered. And the centering of, the f of all faces is the nose. So whether it's a ceramic figure or a human figure, you're going to center it around the placement of the nose. Obviously, you're not going to have the nose uh, way over to the side. Um, there are uh, there are some wonderful things about this uh, this little piece. It seems to be rather uh, nicely made, and it also is uh, uh, has a sort of a certain European look about it. I don't think that you could ever say that this looks as though it has been made in Japan. It really has a it has an old world European look about it. It's probably uh, taken from an old mold of an old piece, and that's why it looks like that. But here we have the center of the uh, of the figure, and here is approximately the placement of the nose. Why anybody thinks that St. Nick uh, has got to have blue eyes and uh, rosy cheeks is all because of the myth that is attached to, to all this. And the other myth that I think is interesting is that this is associated with Christmas. Uh, it's all really terribly mixed up in history. Uh, uh, Christmas is is uh, to all intents and purposes uh, to celebrate the birth of Jesus, uh, which actually happened in April. 
That's when the oh, sheep are lowing. Uh, however, that doesn't seem to make too much difference to the people that insist upon carrying on this tradition. That this is a uh, that the um, that the birth of Jesus and the uh, event of Santa Claus is uh, <laughs> is problematic. Uh, however, I'm not going to start throwing monkey wrenches and things. I'm just going to make the observation that this kind of a this this kind of a symbol uh, can, uh, can certainly get all mixed up in legend and so on. Uh, apparently, Saint Nick uh, is a German um, uh, tradition, uh, and bringing the tree inside the house is also a German tradition, but uh, everybody got into the act, and now uh, it's all got to do with um, Britain and Charles Dickens and uh, Italy and uh, uh, Niccolo and all this thing, and so the, 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 whole, the whole point is that we go along with this, uh, and uh, I think the bottom line is that it is a tremendous uh, commercial uh, boon uh, to, to, to um, to just about everywhere in the world. Uh, I find that unfortunate, and, uh, and I also find that the uh, proliferation of uh, oft-repeated symbols of this particular uh, event uh, is, usually made in, in, uh, is usually made in shabby and tawdry and cheap uh, items. Uh, I think that they all, it should all ought to be done, in my opinion, with plants and lights and um, uh, handmade objects. Uh, uh, long ago, I uh, decided that uh, Christmas, buying Christmas presents was not my thing, I make them. And whatever anybody gets from me, I have made with my hands and uh, uh, let all the Purchased, purchased stuff come from others. Anyway, I've got the layout of this head. The center line may be worrying people, but it is a, this is a lesson as well as a demonstration and as well as a as a little symbolic celebration of a of the Christmas season. So, if you if you see that the beard is in the center of this line, those are the guidelines to be used. Somewhere here and somewhere here is when is where the, the red cloak begins to uh, to fall over the body, and it and it's got some nice flowing lines I must say it's beautifully painted so the person I believe that I can look up and see uh, the name of the person that, uh, that did this the re point of reference here is that this shoulder line hits somewhere in the middle of the beard uh, may maybe this this kind of thing is helpful to some um, I'm hoping it is but uh, it should also be of interest to, to know how one gets the proportion of an object such as this without without running into uh, tremendous distortions uh, it's easy it is the simplest thing in the world to distort this kind of thing and find yourself having drawn it completely incorrectly from the very beginning hopefully and anybody who's foolish enough to have a show like this live on the air um, and we'll learn the lesson that this is definitely uh, dangerous territory. But I think that somewhere in the middle, somewhere at, the, uh, at this part of the beard, this is about one third of the size of the, uh, of the piece. And so you go down to another third, and then you have another third, and you've got a little bit of a play down here for snow or whatever, or shadows. And so here we have this, uh, this jolly old fellow's uh, cloak that is uh, falling down around the body. And he's got some nice details. Uh, the uh, the cloak does not fall evenly. It comes down on the left side, but it is flowing over on this side because he's holding a bell. And uh, the shoulder has to be somewhere opposite that. So this is all uh, also a lesson in drawing and points of reference, something that I touch upon with landscapes. But it's very different when you're doing a piece of uh, a, 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 a stationary piece. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't move. And this is one of the best ways to learn how to draw, to find something which is there, set up for you to observe at your leisure in your own environment and to be able to correct with an eraser, a pencil or uh, a cloth full of turpentine if you happen to be painting. Um, that uh, uh, a still object is the best uh, is the best lesson in learning how to draw, and also the uh, the few uh, the few very definite rules that go with the points of reference of what is in proportion to something else. I'm now working on this hand. The hand should be in fairly uh, good proportion to the rest of it. Um, 
if it isn't, then you uh, catch it immediately and hope that you can uh, save it. It is uh, really irritating to have to redraw something after you've gone through the whole thing. However, it is worth the effort because if you if you don't redraw it, then you're, it's going to look terrible as you finish it. And putting all the paint on, and then you say the hand's too small, the hand's too big, the hand's out of place, and so on. So try to get the drawing properly from the beginning. This is going to be done in two parts. It looks to me like um, the major part of the first part of this particular um, uh, lesson, I'm going to call this a lesson, is the drawing of it. Naturally, the application of paint is going to have something to do with it, but the sleeve is going to occupy approximately this length, and then down here, as the cloak comes sw swinging down in a, in a sort of a graceful way, the sleeve gets left, and the, the swing of the coat uh, comes approximately to this far underneath the sleeve. So, um, with the, at the risk of boring everybody out of their minds and switching the channel to something else, I'm going to pursue this and uh, do like the teachers do in school, pay attention. Um, of course, you are perfectly at liberty of, in fact, doing that, uh, switching off to something else. But um, I, I assume that the people who tune in on this are interested in the process of how you accomplish this kind of a, this kind of a discipline. And there is no question that this is a discipline. It is certainly uh, far from just applying paint to canvas. If you don't draw, you, um, you find yourself in need to uh, brush up on that. And drawing is a matter of uh, understanding how to transfer the third dimension to the second dimension. That's all you're doing. The little knot over here is somewhat over to the, uh, over to the right of the, of the center guideline. And the, um, the swing of this, uh, of this uh, sash takes place approximately in the middle of it. So uh, as, a, uh, as an object lesson, and you follow it as best you can. If it becomes slightly interpretive, uh, there is no scolding. Uh, you, you can interpret it a little bit. Uh, because this is, after all, a painting. It is not a drawing with which, uh, from which you're going to make the ceramic piece. It is a painting of the ceramic piece. And there is a, a charming uh, a gift shop right near my gallery in Front Royal, Virginia, which, in which these, uh, these craftspeople, and it is rare to find craftspeople in America today. Usually it is stamped from another country. But there are craftspeople living in the hills and the mountains of uh, Northern Virginia and producing some really actually charming stuff. Uh, this, is, this is an example of it. Uh, the, uh, the town, of course, is... Uh, is um, be becoming Christmasified uh, during the past week, just like it is here. And, um, and the only difference is that there is uh, a great deal of greenery because the woods and the forest, the Shenandoah National Forest is right by, and uh, the theme of greenery is carried through maybe a little bit more. Here it's more concentrating on lights, maybe because of the uh, proximity to the big city that people are very concerned with lights, uh, which are wonderful, and I use them as often as possible. But uh, down there it's greens that are doing the major part of the decoration. All right, the figure, uh, fortunately, <laughs> I have been able to contain it within its given area. And here's the little black foot that sticks out from underneath. It's going to be just slightly interpreted. And you'll notice the a rather generous use of paper towels that represents the snow. You do things when you need to interpret, and I did not come with either fake or ready-made snow. So here we have. Now this second, the hand, let me see where the placement of this, uh, of this uh, belt is. We've got to find the belt. It comes over his shoulder here, crosses over, and winds up somewhere there. The belt is, um, the belt is one of the major parts of this. It does not, anyway, I don't have to talk about everything uh, all the time. It, uh, my, my poor husband who watches some of these programs says, uh, asks in a very polite manner, do you have to talk every instant? And apparently um, that was a well-founded question because I do talk every instant, but one, one is afraid of something in this business called dead air. And uh, so I avoid that. Anyway, to get back to the, um, to the Christmas thing, uh, I would love to be able to see a, a, a really uh, 
uh, not a change, but an improvement, I suppose is the term I'm looking for, in the whole uh, celebration of this season, uh, whereby uh, before uh, the uh, pumpkins have been put away and taken off the porch and either made into soup or consigned to the garbage, uh, there are Christmas lights going up. Uh, you haven't even had a chance to figure out whether or not it's going to be turkey or chicken uh, before the Christmas lights are upon you. And the whole uh, thrust of um, the amount of money that can be made and the fact that the uh, shops are open until 11 o'clock at night or whatever, uh, that it, the commerciality has uh, really become, begun to become uh, a, a little bit excessive. So I'm thinking that maybe it would be a, a, an innovative idea in this, uh, in this period of change and maybe coming on to the 21st century when we're supposed to have uh, accumulated a small amount of wisdom over the years that maybe the wisdom can set in and that we will in fact maybe begin to make uh, things for Christmas. I, uh, I've got, uh, I've got a, a box and a trunk full of things that were made for me uh, when I was very little and they are not only still here but they're also still in pretty good shape because they were made with tremendous care and not turned out by the millions. So and I'm doing this doll. Uh, hope, hopefully she'll be a little bit more attractive than what I've got her going here. She is waving at us and she is sticking out of this pouch that um, is a, another traditional thing. Santa Claus apparently, or Saint Nick, uh, had a pouch f full of things for only good children, which is um, uh, the time that I'm now going to break because then I'll maybe get off onto some dissertation about what's a good child. So don't go too far, I'll be right back. Here we are back with uh, St. Nick and uh, my, uh, my general um, uh, voiced opinions about things that have to do with this season. The, the, um, the, uh, the last thing I think I said before the break was, what's a good child? Well, I'm not a philosopher and I'm certainly not anyone who has uh, got degrees in this kind of conversation, but I think a good child is as good as the parent. Uh, if you're a good parent, you probably have a good child. And uh, the ones that go astray, uh, you can usually find when the, when the news media gets finished with it, you find that they have been somehow not had been fortunate to have good, what you might call good parents. So, uh, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not shout, I'm telling you why, Santa Claus is coming to town. That's, uh, that is uh, a really hackneyed and worn out um, bit of nonsense, in my opinion. The child is going to be good whether Santa Claus comes or not, or he's going to be bad whether Santa Claus comes or not. And um, so, it's a season which I find um, I work very hard at this season, uh, doing things because I make all these presents that I that I give, and I'm reduced my list. 
because um, some people in this world have got the largest collection of early windrow paintings ever, anywhere. But they like them, and they seem to, uh, they seem to survive m many seasons. And I also sew a good deal, and I also try to um, put things in jars that are sweet tasting. So Christmas to me is, um, is uh, very much like um, any other day where you think about other people and then manage to do something about it. So, here we have a general composition and a layout. If we can get fanciful, this is the drawing. This is almost the entire show to do the drawing of this particular object. And maybe we can fantasize uh, that instead of putting paper towels down here for the uh, snow, just to have a, um, uh, a sort of a, an imagined hill of snow and have it, um, give, it, uh, give it my favorite thing called a diagonal and that he has just, uh, that this little figure has just come walking down a ceramic uh, s hill of snow and so on. And maybe, maybe it's at nighttime. Anyway, this is, the, um, this is the moment where you can begin to apply uh, color to a canvas. Before that, it's guesswork. Naturally, this is all extremely, uh, the, the less is more uh, in, this in this instance, that um, if you can have the time to do all the details and you want to make it actually look like a ceramic piece, uh, then you would have to concentrate on a, on a great deal of what happens to ceramics when the light hits it. In the meantime, I'm going to be rather content in the first part of this uh, two piece part to apply the paint uh, carefully with nice little uh, um, deliberate strokes with some paint that comes directly from the tube. This is alizarin crimson starting, uh, I always start at the top, uh, why I don't know, but I, uh, I think that probably the top because that's how we learn to write. We start at the top of the page. I don't imagine that there's any culture in the world that starts anywhere else but the top of a page or the stone wherever, wherever you happen to be writing your your, your writing. So starting at the top is, uh, is the application of this pure color. The uh, shading of it will come and the highlights will come in the next, uh, in, in the next uh, little half hour segment of this program. And um, uh, something to be learned about that. You know, what is the, uh, how do you make red? In, how do you make the shadows in red? if you're interested in that. Now this is also, uh, also sort of a preamble to doing any kind of still life. Uh, any kind of still life is going to involve the same process. It's going to involve working from life uh, in a contained area, in a, in a given size, and then it's going to be going back and forth to the reference material until you have either achieved a three-dimensional look or until you have achieved merely a design and a pattern. Um, somebody designed this figure, somebody made the original, then the mold was made, then the ceramicist uh, put it, uh, you know, poured the clay into it, and it found its way into the kiln and so on, and then to, into the hands of the artist that painted it. So there are many processes for, a, for an object like this to, uh, to take place, but there's also a lot of process for this object to have a painting done of it. Uh, it, is, it is exactly the same approach that you would have to setting up uh, a still life of uh, apples and onions and potatoes and candles and flowers and vases and anything else. It is all the placement, the proportion, and the accuracy of the drawing. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a tremendous movement uh, of, of, of um, abstract art which would not be concerned in the least about the, uh, the shape or the accuracy of the drawing or even to try and make it look like anything. It would be a, it would be a, a whole different approach. That's not mine. I don't find it that I can be too critical of it because I really have not uh, investigated as, as much as I could have. I've been busy doing realism. Um, but uh, the, the small deliberate strokes that you need to take, uh, the, uh, in my opinion, the sable brush that needs to be used so that the paint can be put on smoothly. And as you can see, with a slight diluting with some of my drying oil uh, is, um, is going to mean that, the, um, that I'm preparing exactly what I do with other things. I prepare the background for the shading uh, when I do this. The whole background of this, oops, I ran over. Oh yes, this um, this uh, coat ends here. Um, the sh the uh, the shading and the highlights are going to be uh, a workable uh, lesson for the second one 
and hopefully the interest will remain uh, as high as I as it might uh, I may lose it but um, right down here where that heavy shadow is cast from the pouch you will see how with a uh, well-observed uh, interpretation of that shadow that this part of the of the Santa will become uh, three-dimensional and it will also um, let's do it right now as long as I'm talking about it. here's the underside where the shadow hits it hard that's a little it's it's it's, it's so dark uh, there that it's it's, it's difficult to be oh, there you go um, but uh, the audience uh, I'd like the audience to be able to see how the um, how the shadow, a painted shadow, is, uh, makes this uh, become um, very observable as a three-dimensional, um, see that shadow conforms to the line of the, um, of the cloth, or what, what is representing cloth. So all of, this is, uh, all of this is in the process of observation. Uh, there is no way in the world that I would be able to invent this, and that's why I work from life, and that's why I have maintained for a very long time that working from life is easier than trying to um, work without any reference material. So we have here, before the, before the time wears out too much, we have the highlight. And uh, the, the, the paint is probably not set well enough for, for the highlight to go in, but let's try it anyway, because it's a very small highlight. And it's, uh, it, I'm going to be doing it with, um, with some of this quick drying white, because uh, highlights are usually put on rather thick and they need to have some time, they need to have the help of drying. Good. Let me just get this highlight on here, which, is, which conforms to the shape of the, of the, uh, of the piece. And uh, the, um, you need only very little of it. And that kind of makes it look like it's, uh, let me see, I think I can probably uh, less uh, harsh, this, this is too harsh here. It has to be, there you go, pull it out. Uh, I'm going to uh, then uh, uh, do the rest of the highlights on the on the robe, and then the next program will be um, will be concentrating on the other details of the uh, of the white and the cloth. So here, let's get into the sleeve area once again. It's the same it's the same observation that you find the shadow is good and intense, very dark up here in the sleeve area. It will separate the sleeve from the rest of it with the, sh with the, uh, the, there is no light without shade. And the minute you put this in, you realize there is a, uh, there is a possibility of everything becoming three-dimensional uh, as long as the shadows are properly done. The shadows can be intense or very dark. I'm not going to use any black. I'm going to use some Van Dyke brown to make the shadows as intense because we have a very sharp, um, uh, light here. The, uh, the lighting is, is, is harsh here in the studio. So, and then underneath here comes another shadow on the under part of the sleeve. And even though it is a uh, stiff piece, it is not soft sculpture. This is definitely a hard sculpture. The attempt has been made by the, by the mold makers to give you the feeling of cloth. This is a w wonderful lesson uh, for anybody who wants to work on cloth, is to work from a ceramic piece. Uh, whereby you can you can sort of study the way cloth goes uh, in a fixed and frozen uh, content. Uh, there is the shadow of the uh, of the of the hood onto the uh, onto the body, and then th there is this triangular division here, and uh, and it's beginning maybe to look as though it's got some form to it. Uh, this, of course, is uh, this, of course, comes down here. And if you do ever try uh, to um, to paint cloth, practice on a piece uh, that is frozen, such as this. Uh, the piece that you see, uh, the part that you see on your screen, has been uh, taken uh, as a frozen uh, entity. And I'm not working from that. I'm working from the piece itself. But what you're seeing is the um, is the image. Okay. Well, I've gotten the signal that this is the uh, this is the time to end this particular par portion, this part one, of a study of Saint Nick, and uh, I hope that it was informational, not too tiresome because it had to be drawn so carefully. But there were points made that you might not have heard of before, so maybe all isn't lost on this first part. Second part is the denouement of uh, Saint Nick's study. So thanks for watching. Come back the next time. Bye-bye.